Hello folks, uh, hopefully we're recording okay, yeah, and thank you for joining me. This will be part one of a series I'm going to name The Name Game. It'll be called The Name Game. And uh, I've heard the name games before. People always try to get all picky and ridiculous with it. These are people who do not know the Lord. When on a spiritual level, the labels and names mean nothing. Labels and names are created by man in their made languages, which are limiting and deceiving, especially Western languages, which omit words in order to limit expression of concepts and also in order to control perception and ideas. Words are spells. Okay, That's why it is called spelling. When one is formulating a word, they trap the mind into a limitation. Jesus is Latin. To mean the same as Yeshua, which is the Hebrew. Some call him Isu. Some call him Yahushua. There are many different languages on the earth. That is why the Lord measures our hearts and looks beyond the limitations of languages. What counts for the human nature is the feeling the word invokes within us. This is what the Spirit of the Lord is concerned with not the label itself. He knows that we have these limitations in understanding. This is also why the Lord cannot be fooled by words. He knows the intentions behind every action, every emotion, and He is also well aware of the way these spells, words, can be used to deceive and sidetrack people into deception and confusion. I don't allow the word game to be played on my videos and comments. Most of the people playing the word game have no idea what they are propagating and participating in. Many people get stuck in their concepts because of the scriptural references to name. In his name it is said. Therefore people try to limit not only each other in the name game but God himself. They try to put God in a box in other words by saying that if you are speaking the wrong name then you are talking to the wrong God. This is a very foolish gesture. For the Lord knows who you are meaning better than we know ourselves. It is our subconscious emotion. The inner self is learned to relate concepts to words. So if one says Jesus and is feeling that it is the title of their Lord, creator of all things, then to them that is what it means. It doesn't matter what the word means to someone else, and the same applies to any label on any subject. Black is white, white is black, depending on who is referring to it. People are limited by their doubts more than by their knowledge. Gnosis is something that it in, is an energy signature, not something that is learned. This can be readily exampled in the use and definition of the word and term agnostic or agnostic, in proper form. Many people mispronounce the word and misconceive its meaning. Most of the uninitiated pronounce the word agnostic, when in fact it is pronounced gnostic. Or a Gnostic. With the G being silent, it means gnosis, knowing. Thus, a Gnostic is one who knows or one who has knowledge. In other words, knowing the ledge equals knowledge. Many who think and say it wrongly also do not know the meaning of it. Many confuse it with an incorrect definition of not believing in a God, like an atheist. When in fact the term itself says more than that, it means knowing God, knowing creation, knowing, not believing, but knowing. Gnostics know there is a God and know about the fundamentals of creation. They just don't ascribe to any particular religion. We know better. Some verse to be considered uh, concerning the differences between languages and limiting languages and the Lord's understanding. Hosea, uh, come here, lay down, goofball. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you. That you shall be no priest to me, seeing you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. Hosea 6 6. 
For I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Isaiah 5.13 Therefore my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge, and their honorable men are famished, and their multitude dried up with thirst. Revelation 2.2 2. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how canst not bear them which are evil? How thou canst not bear them which are evil, sorry, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars. Isaiah 1 3. The ox knows his master, the donkey his own manager, or his owner's manager, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Revelation 3.15 I know thy works, that thou art neither hot, cold, nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot. Proverbs 25, or 20, chapter 5 Counsel in the heart of a man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. Mark 7.20 And he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. Psalm 59.7 Behold, they belch out with their mouth, swords are in their lips, for who, they say, does hear? Matthew 15.11 It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Proverbs 15.2 The tongue of the wise uses knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools pours out foolishness. Proverbs 10.32 The lips of the righteous know what is acceptable, but the mouth of the wicked speaks forwardness. Matthew 15.18 But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. Proverbs 4.23 Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Luke 6.45 A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For the abundant for of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. So play not the word games with people. You know your intentions, you know what your heart desires when speaking. Let no others define your language for you, lest it defile your true nature and corrupt your righteousness. And with that intro, we will move on in this first section. will be concerning the two names that are commonly used for the name of the Lord, which I will go ahead and kind of cut to the chase other than proving my point, but uh, the, nobody knows the name of the Lord. Okay, The name of the Lord, the Creator, other than His earthly name as Jesus or Jesus or uh, Yeshua, Emmanuel, um, his various names as he was on earth and in prophecy as a sentient incarnate being in this matrix. Uh, nobody knows the name that was used before because the Jewish uh, rabbis and stuff of old, long, long before the, even before the Bible and Christianity was ever even invented, and, and put together and all that, uh, they scratched the name because of Moses' Ten Commandments. Uh, everybody was forbidden, even the rabbis themselves, to pronounce the name out loud. It was written, but it was not spoken because of the commandment, Thou shalt not take thy Lord's name in vain. So to this day on record, we do not have his real name of the Creator. So we have made substitutes to refer to him. One of those substitutes we will define now is Yahweh. And one of the name games being played is there that I say, ooh, look at them big snow. Wow, that's gigantic snowflakes. Sorry, I got distracted there. <laughs> that just started falling. They're falling like bricks out of the sky. Giant, this uh, storm Rocky is just moving in on us here in Detroit. So uh, back to the point. Um, a lot of people are saying that Yahweh is, you know, I don't know where they're getting this. Uh, here's a moon god, etc., etc., etc. We're going to define what Yahweh means, where it comes from, and what it what what it refers to exactly. Uh, the Tetragrammaton, 
Jehovah and God in Aramaic religions. Okay, Yahweh uh, is Hebrew. It is the name of the national God of Israel in the Hebrew Bible. Despite the Bible story according to which the Israelites originated from Mesopotamia uh, via slavery in Egypt, the evidence indicates that they were native to Canaan. Yahweh, however, was not a Canaanite God. The modern scholars see him originating in Edom, the region south of Judah. The goddess Asherah may have been Yahweh's consort in the earliest period, originally the main god of the Iron Age kingdoms of Israel and Judah. Worship of Yahweh alone, monotheism, became entrenched in Judaism in the Exilic and Persian periods. The Bible describes Yahweh as the God who delivered Israel from Egypt and gave the Ten Commandments, and it says that Yahweh revealed himself to Israel as the Lord who would not permit his people to make idols or worship other gods. I am Yahweh, that is my name, I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. Now the name itself, biblical, biblical <laughs> Biblical Hebrew was written with consonants only, meaning that the name was written Y-H-W-H, -H, or in uh, Hebrew it's uh, uh, Yad, Yad, He, Vod, or Ved, uh, let me, I'm, I'm messing that up here, let me, uh, I'm not good at, at Hebrew, but we'll, we'll get to that in a minute, actually, the actual Hebrew in another part here, that, and I can read it <laughs> instead of trying to uh, say it off of memory, because, you know, I'm no good at the Hebrew. Anyway, the original pronunciation, what, pronunciation was lost many centuries ago, but the available evidence indicates that it was on all likelihood Yahweh. Uh, the components of Yahweh are Y, meaning roughly he, or he, and uh, the consonantal root of HWH, which is connected with acts of creation. Well, you'll cut that out. The one who's biting me for you, the one come up here bugging me, kiddo, which is connected with the acts of creation. There appear to be two main lines of reasoning to explain the origin of the name. The first, suggested as a shortened form of a sentence used in worship. He that causes to be, or he that creates. <laughs> he creates. From El Du Yahweh Sabaat. El, who created the hosts, meaning the heavenly army, accompanying the god El as he marched outside, or beside, out beside the earthly armies of Israel. The second looks of, for the origins of Yahweh to the southeast of Israel in Edom and Midian are even further south Semitic languages like Arabic. H-W-Y in Arabic is connected with falling or causing to fall, leading to an interpretation of Yahweh as a storm god whose name means he who causes to fall, <laughs> Excuse me, meaning rain, lightning, and his enemies. Or he that causes storms. This helps explain Yahweh's attributes as a storm god. He comes to the rescue Israel surrounded by darkness and thick clouds. And the earth trembles and the clouds drop water and the mountains quake at his appearance. And the way he appropriates attributes from the rival storm god Baal. Now the history, the Kenite hypothesis. Okay, the Bible tells a story in which the Israelites escaped from Egypt, met Yahweh on a mountaintop in the wilderness, agreed to become his chosen people, and conquered Canaan with his help. The archaeological evidence points to Israelite community arising peacefully and internally in the highlands of Canaan. Now, if Yahweh was not a Canaanite god, this raises the question of where he originated and how he became the national god of Israel and Judah in the Iron Age too. The uh, which was 1,000 you know, to 586. Uh, the first probable record of his name is in two Egyptian inscriptions from the 14th and 13th, 13th centuries as a place name. 
uh, YHW in the region of Edom associated with Shashu Bedouins. According to a widely accepted theory, the Kenite hypothesis, the Edomite god Yahum uh, could have been brought to north uh, brought north to the Canaanite hill country and the early Israelites by migratory Edomite uh, desert tribes of whom the Kenites were one. Now the national god of Israel in the Iron Age won the religious life of ordinary Israelites like that of other peoples throughout the ancient Near East was organized around the family based cult uh, of the ancestors in devotion to a local god, the god of the fathers. According to the Bible, the first king Saul was a Gibeonite, a tribe with its roots in Edom. In order to unify the new kingdom and cement his own authority, Saul promoted his own god, Yahweh, as god of the kingdom. Previously, each extended family or clan was the people of a particular god, but now the entire Israelite community became the people of Yahweh. Yahweh was the god of the northern kingdom of Israel by at least early 9th century BCE and this confirmed by an inscription from the Kuntilet of Zrud, uh, which refers to Yahweh of Samaria probably meaning the kingdom rather than the city. The more than 40 inscriptions mentioning Yahweh or Yahu or Yah have been discovered all tending to reinforce a certain centrality of Yahweh to the Israelite religion. The inscriptions include blessings, oaths, salutations, votive offerings, seals, and prayers. No other gods or goddesses are in unambiguously recorded except for the contentious references to Asherah, who might be a goddess and Yahweh's consort, or possibly some type of cult object. A fragment from the Kuntalek Azrud 9th and 8th centuries mentions Baal in association with Yahweh, but in this case the word might simply mean Lord, the literal meaning of Baal. The 10th century cult stand from Tanakh, a town uh, northern Israel near Midigo, or Megiddo, uh, shows among other images two winged sphinxes with an empty space between them, possibly meant to represent Yahweh between the cherubim. The horse or bull figure on the same stand topped by a solar disc may represent either Yahweh or Baal, uh, Baal and uh, as a, and a stylized tree and female figures are testimony to the presence of goddesses, possibly Asherah, in the pantheon. Evident, evidence increasingly suggests that many Israelites worshipped Asherah as the consort of Yahweh. The various biblical passages indicate that statues of the goddess were kept in Yahweh's temples in Jerusalem, Bethel, and Samaria. Uh, other evidence includes, for example, the 8th century combination of iconography and inscriptions discovered at the Kundalet Ezrud in the northern Sinai Desert, where a storage jar shows three anthropomorphic figures and an inscription that refers to Yahweh and his Asherah. Further evidence includes that many female figurines unearthed in ancient Israel supporting the view that Esherah functioned as a goddess and consort of Yahweh and was worshipped as the Queen of Heaven. Yahwism Archaeologists and historical scholars use a variety of ways to organize and interpret the available iconographic uh, and textual information. William G. Diver contrasts uh, official religion, state religion, book religion of the elite with folk religion of the masses. Rainier Abritz uh, contrasts official religion with family religion, personal piety, and internal red religious pluralism. Jacques Berlinerbla analyzes the evidence in terms of official religion and popular religion in ancient Israel. Patrick D. Miller has distinguished three broad categories of Yahwism, Orthodox, Heterodox, and uh, Synchronistic. Uh, Orthodox Yahwism demanded the exclusive worship of Yahweh, although without denying the existence of other gods. The powers of blessing, health, wealth, cont continuity, fertility, and salvation, forgiveness, victory, deliverance from oppression and threat, resided fully in Yahweh, the, and his will was communicated via oracle and prophetic vision or audition. Divination, soothsaying, and necromancy were prohibited.
the individual or community could cry out to Yahweh and would receive a divine response mediated by priestly or prophetic figures. Sanctuaries were erected in various places and were used to express devotion to Yahweh by means of sacrifice. In festival meals and celebrations, prayer and praise, towards the end of the 7th century BCE in Judah, worship of Yahweh was restricted to the temple in Jerusalem, while the major sanctuaries in the northern kingdom were at Bethel, near the southern border, and Dan in the north. Certain times were set for the gathering of the people to celebrate the gifts of Yahweh and the deity's acts of deliverance and redemption. Everything in the moral realm was understood as a part of a relation to Yahweh as a manifestation of holiness. Family relationships and welfare on the weaker members of society were protected by divine law and the purity of conduct, dress, food, and etc. were regulated. Religious leadership presided in priests who were associated with sanctuaries and also in prophets who were the bearers of divine oracles. In the political sphere, the king was understood as the appointee and agent of Yahweh. Heterodox, heterodox, heterodox Yahwism is described by Miller as a mixture of elements of orthodox Yahwism with particular practices that conflicted with orthodox Yahwism for uh, or were not customarily a part of it. For example, heterodox, hetero, heterodox sorry, Yahwism included the presence of cult objects rejected by orthodox expressions such as Asherah, the figurines of various sorts, females, horses, riders, animals, birds, and the calves or bulls of the northern kingdom, the high places as centers of worship seem to have been moved from an acceptable place within Yahwism to an increasingly condemned status in the official and orthodox circles. Efforts to know the future or the will of the deity could also be understood as heterodox if they were uh, went outside the boundaries of, boundaries of orthodox Yahwism, and even commonly accepted revelatory mechanisms such as dreams could be condemned if the resulting message was perceived as false. Consulting mediums, wizards, and diviners was often employed by heter heterodora heterodox Yahwis. Now, syncretism or syncretism covers the worship of Baal or Baal and the heavenly bodies the sun the moon the stars and the queen of heaven and other deities as well as practices such as child sacrifice other gods were invoked and serviced in the time of need or blessing and provision for life when the worship of Yahweh seemed inadequate for those purposes now Ancient Israel and Judah has traditionally been believed that monotheism was a part of Israel's original covenant with Yahweh on Mount Sinai, and the idolatry cr criticized by the prophets was due to Israel's backsliding. But during the 20th century, it became increasingly recognized the Bible's presentation raises a number of questions. Why do the Ten Commandments declare there should be no other gods before me if there are no other gods at all? Why do the Israelites sing at the crossing of the Red Sea that there is no God like you, Yahweh, uh, implying that other gods exist? These observations eventually overthrew the belief that Israel had always worshipped no other God but Yahweh. Evidence of Israelite worship of Canaanite gods appears in both the Bible and archaeological record. Respectful references to the goddess Asherah, or her symbol, for example, as part of the worship of Yahweh, were, are found in the 8th century inscriptions of the Kuntilet Azrud the, and the uh, Kerbet el Qom. The in references to the Canaanite gods, Reshef and Debir, appear without criticism in the original Jewish text of the Hab uh, Habakkuk uh, 3 5. While traditionally these words have been understood to be either Jewish words whose meaning has been derived from characteristics of these Canaanite deities or references to demons. Some interpret these as evidence of Israelite recognition of these gods as part of the military retinue of Yahweh the host of heaven is also mentioned without criticism in 1 Kings 22:19 and Zephaniah 1:5 
though the host of heaven has traditionally been interpreted as either the stars, heavenly bodies, or the host of angels, heavenly spirits, depending on the context. Some, again, have interpreted this term to refer to a pantheon of Israelite gods. The god El is also continually identified with Yahweh. Israel inherited polytheism from the late first millennium Canaan, and the Canaanite religion in turn had its roots in the religion of the second millennium Ugarit. Um, in the second millennium, polytheism was expressed through the concepts of the divine council and the divine family and the single entity with four levels. The chief god and his wife, El and Asherah, the seventy divine children or stars of El, including Baal, Astarte, Anat, probably Reshef, as well as the sun goddess uh, Shepshu and the moon god Yerak. Okay, so right there for you people that keep saying Yahweh is the moon god, blah blah. No, the moon god is Yerek, okay, not Yahweh uh, or El. And in, in the head helper of the divine household, Karthar Wahasis, and the servants of the divine household, including the messenger gods, who would later appear as the angels of the Hebrew Bible. In the earliest stage, Yahweh was one of the seventy children of El, each of whom was the patron deity of one of the seventy nations. This is illustrated by the Dead Sea Scrolls and the subsequent text of Deuteronomy 32.8.9 in which El was the head of the divine assembly gives each member of the divine family a nation of his own according to the number of divine sons. Israel is the portion of Yahweh. The later Maser Maseretic text evidently uncomfortable with the polytheism expressed by the phrase altered it to according to the number of the children of Israel. Um, between the 8th and 6th centuries, El became identified with Yahweh. Yahweh El became the husband of the goddess Asherah, and the other gods and the divine messengers gradually became more expressions of Yahweh's power. Yahweh is cast in the role of the divine king, ruling over all the other deities, as in Psalm 29.2, where the sons of God are called upon to worship Yahweh. And as in Ezekiel 8.10 suggests, the temple itself became Yahweh's palace populated by those in his retinue. It is in this period the earliest clear monotheistic statements appear in the Bible. For example, in the apparently 7th century Deuteronomy 4.35-39, 1 Samuel 2.2 2 and 2 Samuel 7.22, 2 Kings 19.15 and 19. And uh, Isaiah thirty seven sixteen and twenty and Jeremiah sixteen nine and twenty nineteen and twenty, and the sixth century portion of Isaiah uh, forty three ten to eleven forty six six uh, eight um, and forty five five uh, seven fourteen eighteen twenty one and forty six nine, because many of the passages involved appear involved appeared in works associated with either Deuteronomy or Deuteronomistic history, Joshua through Kings or in Jeremiah. Most recent scholarly treatments have suggested that Deuteronomistic movement of this period developed the idea of monotheism as a response to the religious issues of the time. And by the way, we are under an ecclesiastical system now, not a Deuteronomy system just thus our government now. The first factor behind this development involves changes in the Israel social structure. At Igarat, uh, social identity was the strongest at the level of family. Legal documents, for example, were often made between sons of one family and the sons of another. Ugarat's religion, or Ugarit's religion, with its divine family headed by El and Asherah, mirrored this human reality. The same was true in ancient Israel through most of the monarchy. For example, the story of Achen in Joshua 8 suggests an extended family as a major social unit. However, the family lineages went through traumatic changes beginning in the 8th century due to major social stratification, uh, followed by the Assyrian incursions. 
uh, in the 7th and 6th centuries, we begin to see expressions of individual identity. Deuteronomy 26.16, Jeremiah 31.29-30, and Ezekiel 18. A culture with the diminished lineage system deteriorating over a long period of time from 9th or 8th century onward, less embedded in traditional uh, family page and when these centuries are before Christ by the way that we're talking about ninth and eighth and that's why they keep saying them backwards because you're moving forward from the backwards so just to clarify that uh, might be more predisposed all this is before Christ everything we've been talking about here so might be more predisposed uh, both to hold the individual accountable for his behavior and to see individual deity accountable for the cosmos. In short, the rise of the individual as a basic social unit led to the rise of single God replacing a divine family. The second major factor was the rise of the Neo-Assyrian and the Neo-Babylonian empires. As long as Israel was, from its own perspective, part of the community of similar small nations, it made sense to see the Israelite pantheon on par with the other nations, each one of its own patron god. The picture described in Deuteronomy 32, 8-9, the assumption being behind this world view, was that each nation was as powerful as its patron god. However, the Neo-Assyrian conquest of northern kingdom in, uh, seven, in CA 70, 20, 722 challenged this. For if the Neo-Assyrian's empire were so powerful, so must be its god. And conversely, if Israel could be conquered, and later Judah in circa 50, uh, 586, uh, century 586, uh, it implied that Yahweh, in turn, was a minor divinity. The crisis was met by separating the heavenly power and the earthly kingdoms. Even though Assyria and Babylon were so powerful, the new monotheistic thinking in Israel reasoned that this did not, this did not mean that the God of Israel and Judah was weak. Assyria had not succeeded because of the power of its god Marduk. It was Yahweh who was using Assyria to punish and purify the one nation which Yahweh had chosen. By the post uh, exilic period, full monotheism has uh, had observed, uh, emerged. That Yahweh was the sole God, not just of Israel, but of the whole world. And if the nations were tools of Yahweh, then uh, the new king who would come to redeem Israel might, might not be a Judean as taught in the older literature, Psalm 2. Now even a foreigner such as uh, Cyrus or and the, the Persian could serve as the Lord's anointed. And, uh, uh, oh man, sorry, big yawn. Uh, in Isaiah 44, 28 and 45, 1, one God stood behind all the world's history. Now use and context. Uh, contemporary religion Jews cease to pronounce the name in this modern Judaism uh, in the what they call the intertestamental period replacing it with the common noun Elohim the God which means the God to demonstrate the universal sovereignty of Israel's deity over all others at the same time the divine name was increasingly regarded as too sacred to be uttered and was replaced in spoken ritual by the word Adonai or my which means my Lord so and this is so to for people to think okay Elohim is a people it isn't a people or the people of God or whatever it means the God period just like Adonai is not a person it means my Lord okay it, it was a term for the Lord meaning my Lord though it is not a proper name some people try to use Adonai as a proper name of a deity um, that's it's it's a trans transmutation or translation uh, you know depending on whether it's written or spoken Anyway, or with Hashem, the name, which means the name, Hashem, in everyday speech. See the name of God, uh, name of God in Judaism for details, and, and we'll actually get to some of that here in a minute. Not through that link, but um, Christianity, almost all English translations of the Bible, including the King James Version, the Douay Reigns Version, the Revised Standard Version, the New International Version, substitute the terms Lord and God in small caps wherever the Tetragrammaton appears in the Hebrew. 
uh, although the King James Version does use Jehovah in a few instances, a few more recent Bible translations such as the Jerusalem Bible and the New Jerusalem Bible and the Rotherham Emphasize Bible use Yahweh and the liturgical Liturg 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 use of Yahweh in vernacular worship is banned by the Vatican in 2008 rather recently, hey, and the Vatican Congregation for Divine Worship and the dis, uh, Discipline of the Sacraments has directed that the word Lord and its equivalent in other languages be used instead. The Sacred Name Movement is a small Christian movement active since the 1930s which propagates the use of the name Yahweh in Bible translations and in liturgy. Um, the the, the Jehovah or Jehovah Witnesses, the New World Translation, consistently uses Jehovah, even inserting it into the New Testament in place of the Greek Kyrios, meaning Lord. Kyrios means Lord. Jehovah means Lord. We'll get to the Jehovah de definitions here in a minute. In many places. Okay. Um, Yahweh. Or in the original Ye Hebrew, and we're gonna the original Hebrew. Let's go to this for a second, and then we'll go back to that for a second. Ehyad, or Yad, or Yod, I should say, rhymes with road, which we transliterate as a Y. Ehi, or Ehe, rhymes with Se, which we transliterate as a H. Vav, like Vava, Lava, we transliterate as a Y or a V. And then there's another He on it. So what we have here, in God's name, the I Am, or I Am that I Am, reveals the fullness of His nature. All of God's nature and attributes are embodied in His name. God's name is written in the Hebrew right to left of these signatures here um, and we'll show a better picture let's see if we got any other pictures here right there is a bigger picture for you to see these characters this would be the he and and uh, or hey sorry I, I you know spelled he so I would say that but anyway you get the picture you get the picture because here it is right here um, <laughs> originally Hebrew didn't have any vowels and was written right to left although some consonants carry with them the indication of associated vowel sounds for instance the Y is associated with the sound of a long E as in team the H is associated with the sound of a short A as in A ah, or HA and the VAV is associated with the vowel U which produces a uh, sound is in the word cool, so it's a vu. Thus, the name of the creator sounds something like e o e a o a or e a o a. In the accent on the second of the three syllables, as in as the pronunciation convention in Hebrew. Brief study in linguistics. To translate is to explain the meaning of one language using the words of another. To transliterate is to spell a word using the letters of another language. I am is the English translation of the meaning of God's personal name. The English transliteration of God's personal name is YHWH with the vowels added and it sounds as Yahweh. Now, or Yahweh, now translated to I am who I am. Now, or I am I, that's, that's the one I prefer is I am I. But anyway, um, the four Hebrew letters transliterated YHWHR, and this is the characters that we just looked at, a Yod, or Yod, which translate, we transliterate as Y, the He, which rhymes with say, we transliterate as the H. The Vav, or the Va, La Va, which we transliterate as Y or V, and then another He, which would be right here at the beginning there, uh, or He. So it's, uh, it would be 
ja, he, va, ve, ja, he, va, ve, right? No matter what language you use, whether you translate or transliterate, Yahweh's name means I am that I am, and it directly points to his real name, which is true and the same in all languages. Okay, well, with that we'll go over here to the rational. And the Yahweh in the original Hebrew is one of the gods, one of the gods of, the Ab of Abraham that appears in the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh. And the same for the monotheistic God that the Jews and Christians would later worship. Yahweh which does not appear to be a Canaanite God, but instead an Edomite one. The common rendering of the word is sometimes called the Tetragrammaton, which is Greek for a word of four letters. That's what Tetragrammaton is, or Greek for a word of four letters. Since God never actually tells us his name, a commandment telling one not to take his name in vain is a little confusing. <laughs> um, etymology. Okay, the Tetragrammaton and etymology. There are several views of what Yahweh means and where the term originated. The most commonly accepted is that the term comes from Y, the, the Yod, meaning He, and the Semitic root. H W H or the Hebrew he was he we he wa he he wa he which means either to be or to create depending on context mode and inflection making Yahweh he who is or alternately he who creates in Exodus 3:14 God states in response to the question who are you that should send me to the people of Israel uh, uh, Esha, Esha, I am what I am. Without vowels, both scholars of the Bible as well as linguists can only guess on the variation of the root HWH. In context, the word Yahweh, Y H W H, could also mean he who builds or he who lives, like the living God. The root to be has a variation of to live and to breathe and to build or to bring into existence. A second theory is based on the linguistic evidence that the Semitic tri root HWH indicates things which fall or a storm. This argument suggests Yahweh might be indicating that storm god. This highly compelling theory blends with the theory that Yahweh was an Edomic storm god who was adopted into the Canaanite culture. The pronunciation, the original pronunciation, is lost to history. Because the Hebrew Bible contains no vowels, and of course those who would have known the pronunciation are long gone. Kind of like what I was in my last uh, reading on the secret teachings, what I was saying about uh, Pyth uh, Pythagoras, or uh, Pythagoras, sorry, you know, Pythagoras, as I like to say. You know, I say it how it's spelled in English. <laughs> so, but anyway, you know, the same difference. Nobody knows how it was really pronounced. It wasn't even written that way back in the day. Uh, let alone who knows how it was truly pronounced. Well, the same is existing of today. We do what we have with what we've been given. Further, it was historically considered disrespectful to be, speak God's name outside the most sacred of settings. Even today, conservative, conservative and orthodox Jews would not pronounce a name out of respect. In practical terms, the pronunciation is probably Yahweh or something very similar, and this is the usual translation into English. To avoid speaking God's name because that's disrespectful, when Jews read the Hebrew scriptures aloud in prayer, the four letters are pronounced mainly as Adonai, or my Lord, which means I Lord, but also as Elohim, God, in plural singular El, okay, in a few cases taking the taboo even further, some conservative and orthodox Jews simply call God Hashim, mean, literally meaning the name. Um, the name that's unspeakable, in other words, in, you know, in their eye, in their view. Another common Jewish practice, especially among the English-speaking orthodox Jews, is to write the English name as God or uh, name God as G-D with no O in the middle. Or just G E D, um, which would go back to odd, right? Um, English translation Bibles 
uh, represent Yahweh as the Lord. Yahweh means the Lord in small capitals when it stands for Yahweh and the Lord God or the Sovereign Lord when it is Yahweh Adonai or Adonai. The translation as Yahweh is no longer used. It is commonly believed that I has shifted from We to Ve over the past several thousand years. Jehovah versus Yahweehi Yahweehi uh, the earlier, less accurate English rendition of the name is Jehovah, or Yehovah before the J was there, um, which was formed by combination of the consonants uh, Y H W H and the cantillation marks vowels for Adonai. That's where the O comes from, as the word was written in the tank uh, or the Tanakh. Uh, so that even the most absent-minded Jew wouldn't pronounce the sacred name and be struck down in flame. <laughs> the Y become J and the Y and the W become a B because those were the letters that ancient Latin used to represent those sounds. Despite the fact that English J and V sound nothing like in their Latin uh, nothing like their Latin ancestors, this doggedly incorrect transliteration is still used by certain traditionalist groups and the Jehovah's Witnesses. Though Jehovah is generally found in English-speaking Christian groups, it can be sometimes found in English-speaking Jewish sects as well. At least one religious sect, the Jehovah's Witnesses, insists Jehovah is God's real name and insists on its use instead of God. There are also some sects, including many Christian identity believers, who insist that Yahweh is the proper name. Evidence from the archaeological excavations in the Douglas uh, Admezian tradition, the Institute of Taking Impossibility, long times to find out what's painfully obvious, as even a cursory reading of the millennia old Tanakh or the Old Testament with a right mind, although we're not sure how often that happens, strongly suggests that Yahweh wasn't the only God, just one that Abraham promised to worship as so he could take all of Palestine, but the men to the sword, um, the towns to the torch, and the women to bed. <laughs> <laughs> the deal also included sacrificing the good stuff, the gold, silver, wine, and animals to the Lord, making his priests rich. Evidence is found in the Canaanite uh, city of Igret, or Igret, suggests that the ancient Israelites practiced polytheistic northwest Semitic religion with a creator god, El. Yahweh was associated with El and became a national god of the Hebrews. There is some evidence that the god Yahweh or Yahweh YW who was the son of El uh, YW is generally considered to be either or to either be Yahweh or some play on words to make a closer association. El and therefore Yahweh had a wife incidentally named Asherah amazingly the Mormons got it right for once <laughs> and we'll all get our own planet called the Battlestar Galactica <laughs> from which humans will evolve into Cylons and found the 12 colonies of man's to revert to polytheism <laughs> because Yahweh all right uh, no all kidding aside because Yahweh so obviously made such a lousy cosmic protector, killing his own vassals with plagues, hellfire, and brimstone, his patron kingdoms being grounded to dust by the Assyrians and whatnot, he was beefed up by a merger with El, making him not only the particular god of the Hebrews, but also the most powerful god in the cosmos. It's quite clear, though, that even cursory reading of the Old Testament uh, the first commandment that even when the Israelites did not consider Yahweh to be the only God merely the most important one needless to say he is always mentioned in plural uh, Elohim and the single most repeated phrase in the Old Testament is I am the Yahweh your Elohim or the El of Abraham Isaac and Jacob so with that let's Let's go back to here now. Um, I'm I'm trying to do this in a certain order that I don't even know what the order is. I'm just going here. So let's go here. You know, 
again we have the tetragrammaton and Yahweh connection uh, the ancient Hebrew language uh, question what is Yahweh what is the tetragrammaton the ancient Hebrew language and the Hebrew scriptures were written and did not have vowels the original Hebrew God's name is given as Yahweh this is known as the tetragrammaton because of the lack of vowels Bible scholars debate how the tetragrammaton Yahweh was pronounced our uh, YH W H. Contrary to what some Christians and at least one cult that uses his name uh, believe, Jehovah is probably not the divine name revealed to Israel. Due to the Jewish fear of accidentally taking God's name in vain, in Leviticus can be exampled in Leviticus 24:16, they basically quit saying it out loud altogether. Instead, when reading, they substitute the actual tetragrammaton, which is only the consonants of the divine name, Y-H-W-H, since Hebrew is not usually written with vowels included, uh, with the word Adonai, which means Lord. Even in the subjugant of the Greek version of the Old Testament, the translators substitute Curious, which also means Lord, for the divine name. Eventually, the vows from Adonai, Lord, or Elohim, God, found their way into the consonants Yahweh, thus forming Yahweh, when the, with the A's put in the E put in. Uh, but this does not mean that that was how God's name was originally pronounced. Any number of vowel combinations are possible, and the Jews are as uncertain of the real pronunciation as are Christians. Jehovah or Yehovah was actually much later in probably the 16th century bury it in Latin. Here the Y is substituted with a J. Hebrew does not have a J sound and the W with a V plus another vowel combination resulting in Jehovah. This vowel combination is composed of the abbreviated forms of the imperfect, the participle, and the perfect of the Hebrew being verb. Um, English is. Thus meaning of Jehovah could be said to be he who will be is and has been. Okay, so he, the, the interpretation of the whole name of Jehovah in with the vowels as he who will be is and has been or he who was is and will be so what is God's name and what does it mean the most likely choice for how the tetragrammaton was pronounced is Yahweh or something similar to that the name Yahweh uh, Yahweh refers to God's self-existence God, uh, Yahweh is linked with how God described himself in Exodus 314 God said to Moses I am who I am this is what you are to say to the Israelites I am has sent me to you God's name is a reflection of his being God is only self-existent or he is the only self-existent self-sufficient being in the universe only God has life in and of himself that is the essential meaning of the tetragrammaton uh, Yahweh or Yahweh Now, come on. <laughs> now, with that, let's go to Tetragrammaton. See other uses for Tetragrammaton. Um, Yahweh redirects here for discussion of the Yahweh and ancient Semitic religion. See Yahweh. The term tetragrammaton from Greek, uh, or some shit like that, <laughs> meaning four letters, refers to the Hebrew theonym or transliterated to the Latin letters Y H W H. It may be derived from the verb that means to be and is considered in Judaism to be the proper name of the Lord God of Israel used in the Hebrew Bible. The while Yahweh or YHWH is the usual transliteration of the Tetragrammaton in English academic studies, the alternatives YHVH or JHVH or JHWH are also used.
The most widely accepted pronunciation of the Tetragrammaton is Yahweh. Though Jehovah is used in many Bibles, but in a few modern ones, the Samaritan, but in few of the modern ones. In other words, it was used in older Bibles, it's used in few of the newer ones. The Samaritans understood the pronunciation for the Tetragrammaton to be Labe. Some uh, patristic sources give evidence to the Greek pronunci pronunciation of Lao or Leo. Um, as Jews are forbidden to say or write the Tetragrammaton in full, when reading the Torah, they use the term Adonai. Christians do not have any prohibitions on vocalizing the Tetragrammaton. In most Christian translations the Bible, uh, of the Bible, Lord is used in place of the Tetragrammaton after the Hebrew Adonai and is written in small capitals or in all caps to distinguish it from the other words translated Lord. And here we have the different writings here, the Tetragrammaton in the Paleo-Hebrew 10th century BCE to, to 135 CE and then the Aramaic uh, and then also in the Hebrew 3rd century. Um, the letters properly read from right to left in Biblical Hebrew are and you got the Hebrew and you got the Yod, the Y, the He, the H, the Wa, or the lava, wava, in the placeholder for I O U valve, and then back to the he again, or often silent letter at the end of the word. Scholars widely propose that the name Yahweh was a verb form derived from the biblical Hebrew um, triconsonantal root of H Y H to be, which means to be which has H -Y or HWH as a variant form, with the third person masculine Y prefix. It is connected to the passage, Exodus 3.14, in which God gives his name as Ehe uh, Esher Ehe, um, translated most basically as I am that I am, or I will, I will be what I will be, I will be what I am. With the vocalization Yahweh could theoretically be hefil, causative, a verb inflection of the root HWH, with a meaning something like he who causes to exist, or he who gives life, or who gives life. Uh, the root idea of the word being to breathe and hence to live. As a qual, uh, basic stem verb inflection, it could mean he who is or he who exists or he who is who exists. Occurrences. The oldest known inscription of the Tetragrammaton dates to 840 BCE on the Meshestel. It bears the earliest certain uh, extra-biblical references of, to the Israelite God Yahweh. The most recent discovery of a Tetragrammaton inscription was found written in Hebrew on two silver scrolls recovered from Jerusalem dating to the 6th century BCE. In the Hebrew Bible, the Tetragrammaton occurs 6,828 times, as can be seen in the Bible Hebraica and the Biblia Hebraica uh, Stagodnesia. Uh, according to the Brown Driver Briggs, the lexicon occurs 6,518 uh, times. And uh the other word occurs 305 times in the Masoretic text. It first appears in Hebrew in Genesis 2, 4. Uh, the only books it does not appear in are the Ecclesiastes, um, the book of Esther, and the Song of Songs. Uh, the subsequent uh, typically translates Yahweh as Kyrios or Kyros, uh Lord, meaning Lord. The uh, English translation used Lord when it serves as a uh, mnemonic device for Yahweh since they both have four letters. Uh, the most widely accepted pronunciation of the Tetragrammaton is Yahweh. Uh, Genebrardus suggests that the pronunciation Yahweh 
based on Theodoret's uh, assertion that the Samaritans um, use the pronunciation Alave or Labe, L A B E. For the Jews, however, it was forbidden to pronounce or even write in full the Tetragrammaton. Uh, Lucan Williams proposed the pronunciation of the Tetragrammaton to be Yahu or Yahu based on the theophoric names in the Hebrew Bible that end in YHW. The current scholarly consensus is that the Baudaratic or di um, diacritic points uh, attached to the written consonants YHWH in the Masoretic, Masoretic orthography of biblical Hebrew were not intended to represent the vowels of such authentic and historically correct pronunciation. Uh, the Tiberian, Tiberian vocalization vowel points, the original constant, uh, consonantal text of the Hebrew Bible was provided with the vowel marks by the Mesorets uh, to assist reading in places where the consonants of the text to be read uh, differed from the consonants of the written text um, to be read meaning the queer and the written text is the kithib. Uh they wrote the kur in the margin as a note showing that uh, what was to be read in such case the vowels on the kur uh, or kur or kiri you know you could say sometimes some people probably pronounce it kiri um, were written on the Kathab or Kathib. For a few frequent words, uh, the marginal note was omitted, and this is called the Cure or the Curie per, uh, Perpetuum. One of these frequent cases was the Tetragrammaton, <coughs> which, according to later Jewish practices, should not be pronounced, but read as Adonai, meaning my Lord, or if the previous or next word already was Adonai or Adonai or Adonai as Hel Elohim God this combination produces respectively you know and I'm not going to try to pronounce those Hebrew words there but non words that would spell Yehovah or Yehovi, Yehovah Yehovi, Yehovai respectively and there is Adonai or Adonai see also and, and the oldest manuscripts of the Hebrew Bible, uh, such as the Aleppo Codex and the Codex Leningradensis, uh, mostly write Yava, okay, with no pointing on the first H. Uh, this could be because the O diacritic, diacritic point plays no useful role in distinguishing between Adonai and Elohim. Uh, it is so redundant. So, or po could point to the Kiri being uh, Shema, which is Aramaic for the name, or Shema, Shema. Um, consonantal semi-vowels. In ancient Hebrew, the letter, uh, that little squiggly line, <laughs> that little Hebrew letter, known to modern Hebrews as Vav, was a uh, semi-vowel semi uh, W as in English not as in German rather than a V so as a W instead of V the letter is referred to as WA or a WA and uh, in academic or according to accordingly um, the Yahweh word is represented in English academic text as YHWH um, in unpointed Biblical Hebrew, most vowels are not written, and the rest written only ambiguously, as the vowel letters are also used in consonants, um, similar to Latin use of V to indicate both U and V. See uh, Matres Lectionis for details. Uh, for similar reasons, the appearance of the Tetragrammaton in ancient Egyptian records of the 13th century BCE sheds no light on the original pronunciation. Therefore, it is in general difficult to deduce how a word is pronounced from its spelling only, and the Tetragrammaton is a particular example. Two of its letters can serve as vowels, and two are vocalic placeholders, which are not pronounced.
This difficulty occurs somewhat also in Greek when transcribing Hebrew words because the Greeks lack of a letter of, uh, for the consonant Y and since the loss of the uh, diga digamma uh, of a letter for W forcing the Hebrew consonants Yod and Wa to be dis transcribed in the Greek as vowels. Also uh, non-initial H caused difficulty for Greeks and was liable to be omitted. X or Chi was pronounced as K or K plus H is K key um, as in modern uh, Hindi Lakhi um, or Lakh Lakh would be pro proper um, and could not be used to spell H as in modern Greek Zape Harry for example Adonai let me light up one of my little cigars here alright the vocalization of Yahuwah Yahuwah and Adonai are not identical the schwa or the hua in Yahuwah or Yahuwai the vowel under the first letter and the hata paka or pataka the hataf patah in dni the vowel under its first letter appear different the vocalization can be attributed to hebrew uh, biblical hebrew phonology where the hataf patah is grammat uh, grammatically identical to schwa or schwa always replacing every schwa na or schwa na under the guttural letter since the first letter of the uh, hata is guttural letter then the first letter of the patah is not the hata patah under the guttural a lif refer reverts to a regular schwa under the non guttural yohla or yod jeez glad I speak English <laughs> uh, the table below considers the vowel points yah yahoa and adonai respectively there's the table I'm not gonna go through it everybody can go back through everything I've looked at here and if you want to see where I'm getting all this information from you can copy the uh, the uh, you know you can write down or, or write the uh, the links are right up here in this this little address bar um, so we get to uh, note in the table directly above simple shua and Yahuwah or Yahuwah uh, and the Hatapata in Adonai are not the same vowel. The same information is displayed in the table above to the right where Yahweh intended to be pronounced as Adonai and Adonai with a slightly different vowel points are shown to have different vowel points. Okay, The origins for the composite term Jehovah came from early English translators who transposed the vowels uh, from Adonai to the tetragrammaton and read the word literally so that the Y in Yahweh was pronounced as J in English um, and the W as a V and my coffee's gone cold after all this reading taking the spellings at face value may have been as a result of not knowing about the Cur uh thus resulting in the term Jehovah on its spelling variants. The Catholic Encyclopedia, 1913, Volume 8, page 329, states Jehovah, the proper or Yahweh, 
the proper name of God in the Old Testament, had they known about the cure perpetuum, the term Jehovah might not never come into being. Many modern scholars recognize Jehovah to be grammatically, imp grammatically impossible. Jewish Encyclopedia, Volume uh, 7, page 8. Now, Nehemiah Jordan argues against that what he calls the scholarly consensus and says that the English form of Jehovah is quite simply an angelicized form of Jehovah, the pronunciation preserved by the Karite Jews, who included the Masoretes. Scott Jones also argues that the modern scholarship has no evidence for the pronunciation of Yahweh whatsoever, and that its assumption is merely based on a series of other assumptions, while the born-again Christian knows, and the evidence testifies, that the first words ever written by man were simply, in the beginning, God. Some argue that Jehovah is preferable to Yahweh, based on their conclusion that the Tetragrammaton was likely a trisyllabic originally, or was likely trisyllabic originally, and that the modern forms should be, therefore be, have three syllables. Um, Yahweh in the early 19th century, uh, Hebrew scholars were still critiquing Jehovah, aka Lehovah or Lehuwa, uh, because they believed that the vowel points of uh, Yahweh did not represent and were never intended to represent the vowel sounds of the early authentic pronunciation of the Tetragrammaton. The Latin pronunciation uh, of the letter I or J as a consonant sound was the Y sound of the English word U. This changed into the descendant languages into various stronger consonants, including in English the sound uh, the sound J, the word of juice, and thus English pronunciations of the older form Jehovah has this J sound. In order to preserve the approximate original Hebrew of pronunciation, however, English spelling uses the initial Y, and for the third consonant it uses W, a letter unknown in Latin, thus producing the form Yahweh. A Hebrew scholar, uh, Wilhelm uh, Jesenius, from uh, 1786 to 1842 has suggested that the Hebrew pronunciation uh, which is translated into English as Yahweh might more accurately represent the pronunciation of the Tetragrammaton than the Biblical Hebrew pronunciation from which the English name Jehovah was had been derived. His pr proposal to read Yahweh as see, uh, see the image to the left was based on large part on the various Greek transcriptions such as Labe or Laba, Labe, dating from the first century CE, uh, CE, and also on the forms of the Theraphoric names. In his Hebrew dictionary, uh, Jacinius supports Yahweh, which would have been pronounced Yahweh or Jawi, Jawi, uh, with the final letter being silent. Okay, so it would have been Ja, Ja. And that's how it, as in J H Ja, Z Ja, as Z as as Zeph likes to say Z Ja, with the final letter being silent because of the Samaritan pronunciation Lave, uh, reported by Theodoret, uh, and that the Theophoric name prefixes Jeho and Zo, or Yo, can be explained from the form Yahweh or Yahweh. Today many scholars accept uh, Jacinius' uh, proposal to read Yahweh as uh, Yahweh. Jacinius' uh, proposal gradually became accepted as the best scholarly reconstructed vocalized Hebrew spelling of the Tetragrammaton. In the Leningrad Codex, Gerard de Tos wrote in the Leningrad Codex, the Masoretes used seven different vowel pointings uh, for Yahweh, seven different cures for Yahweh. Note that one of these different vowel pointings is not a true variant, but was the result of the addition of an inseparable preposition or preposition to Yahweh, a version of the BHS text, which is derived from the Leningrad Codex is used to translate the Old Testament of almost all English Bibles other than the King James Bible.
The Brown Driver Briggs Lexicon of 1905 shows only two different vowel pointings of Yahweh were found, are found in the Ben Chayan Hebrew text of 1525, which underlies the Old Testament of the King James Bible. Six Hebrew spellings of the Tetragrammaton are found in the Leningrad Codex of 1008 to 1010. As shown below, the entries of the close transcription column are not intended to indicate how the name was intended to be pronounced by the Masoretes, but only how the word sh uh, would be pronounced if read without Cree Prepirta. And this is the little thing. It talks about the chapter and verse in the Hebrew spelling in the close transcription. Pause there for just a second so you can kind of look at that. So the theophoric names Yehol or Yehol is the prefix form of Yahweh used in Hebrew. Theophoric names, the suffix form of Yahu or Yehu, is just as common. This has caused two opinions. In the former times, at least from 1650 CE, the prefix pronunciation Yehu was sometimes connected to the full pronunciation Yehovah, derived from combining the Masoretic vowel points for Adonai with the consonantal tetragrammaton, uh, the Y-H-E-W-H, as we know as Yahweh. Recently, that as Yahweh is likely an imperfect for verb form, Yahu or Yahu is a corresponding preterite or justive form. Compare Yesehua imperfect to yasahu parrot or justic form do obeisance who those who argue for argument one above are george wesley buchanan in the biblical archaeology review smith's 1863 dictionary of the bible and section 2 1 analytical hebrew and child the lexicon in 8 of 1848 in its article smith's 1863 a dictionary of the bible says that yahweh or Yahweh is possible because the shortening of Yahweh would end up as Yahuwah or Yahua or similar. The Jewish Encyclopedia of 1901-1906 in the article Names of God has a very similar discussion and also gives the form Yah contracted as Yeho. And the Encyclopedia Britannica also says that Yeho or Yah can be explained from Yahweh and that suffix Yah can be explained from Yahweh better than from Yehovah. Um, Judaism, to support the view the Tetragram Tom was one time spoken in ancient Israel, the way it is written, this is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. The term forever is Leololam, or Leolam, which in he Biblical Hebrew means always and continually. The Mammonides, relates that only the priests in the temple of Jerusalem pronounced the Tetragrammaton when they recited the priestly blessing over the people daily. Since the destruction of the second temple of Jerusalem in 70 CE, the Tetragrammaton is no longer pronounced. Rabbinical sources indicate that there was an exception for the temple to liturgy where the name of God was only pronounced once a year by the high priest on the Day of Atonement. Others argue that the name was also pronounced in liturgy of the temple in the priestly benediction. Uh, that's in Numbers uh, 627, after the regular day of the sacrifice, while in the synagogues the substitute, probably Adonai, was used. According to the Talmud, in the last generations before the fall of Jerusalem, however, it was pronounced in a low tone so that the sounds were lost in the chant of the priests. Sometime after the destruction of Solomon's temple, the spoken use of God's name, as it was written, had ceased, even though knowledge of how it was pronounced and perpetuated in rabbinic schools, it was certainly known in Babylonia in the latter part of the 4th century. Philo calls it ineffable and says that it is lawful for those only whose ears and tongues are purified by wisdom to hear and utter it in the holy place, that is, for priests in the temple. In other passage commenting on Leviticus uh, what, 29, 15, section, if anyone, I do not say, should blasphemy against the Lord of men and gods, but should even dare to utter his name unseasonably, let him expect the penalty of death, end quote. 
verbal prohibitions. The vehemence in which the utterance of the name is denounced in the Mishnah is suggests that the use of Yahweh was unacceptable in rabbinical Judaism. He, and I quote again, he who pronounces the name with its own letters has no part in the world to come. Such is the prohibition of pronouncing the name as written that it is sometimes called the ineffable or unutterable or distinctive name. Uh, Halakha, the Jewish law, prescribes that whereas the name written yod he vav is it is only to be pronounced Adonai or Adonai. Uh, in the latter name, it too is regarded as a holy name and is only to be pronounced in prayer. Thus, when someone wants to refer in third person to either the written or spoken name, the term Hashim, meaning the name, is used. And this handle itself can also be used in prayer. The Masoret added vowel points in the quid and cantilian or cantillation marks to the manuscripts to indicate vowel usage for use in ritual chanting of readings from the Bible in synagogue services. To that, to that they added that the vows for Adonai, or meaning my Lord, the word to use when the text was read. Um, the written prohi prohibitions, the written tetragrammaton, as well as six other names of God, must be treated with special sanctity. They cannot be, be disposed of regularly, lest they be desecrated, but are usually put in long-term storage or buried in Jewish cemeteries in order to retire them from use. Similarly, it is prohibited to write the tetragrammaton, or these other names, unnecessarily. In order to guard the sanctity of the name, sometimes a letter is substituted by a different letter in writing, or the letters are separated by one or more hyphens. Some Jews are stringent about and extend the above safeguard by also not writing out other names of God in other languages. For example, writing God in English is written as, like I said before, G. Uh, D, G dash D or G D, to and so forth. However, this is beyond the letter of the law. Samaritans. The Samaritans shared the taboo of the Jews about the utterance of the name, and there is no evidence that its pronunciation was common Samaritan practice. However, Sanhedrin 10.1 includes the comment of Rabbi Manna, and I quote, for those, uh, for example, those contum who take an oath. Um, or the priests that would take oath, would also have no share in the world to come, which suggests that the manna, the manna thought that some of the Samaritans used the name in making oaths. Their priests have preserved the literal uh, pronunciation Yahweh or Yahweh, Yahweh to the present day. As with Jews, the Aramaic Hashima or Hashima, meaning the name, remains the everyday usage of the name among Samaritans akin to the Hebrew, the name Hashim. The subjugant, uh, the oldest complete subjugant, meaning the Greek version, uh, Old Testament versions, uh, around the 2nd century CE consistently used Kipiok, or Lord, or, or uh, where the Hebrew was has Yahweh corresponding to substituting Adonai for Yahweh in reading the in the original. In books written in Greek, this period, in this period, wisdom two and the three, uh, two and three Maccabees, as in the New Testament, Kopiak or Kupiak takes the place of the name of God. However, older fragments contain the name Yahweh in the P R. P R Y L four fifty eight, perhaps the oldest extant subsequent uh, manuscript. There are blank spaces, leading some scholars to believe that the Tetragrammaton must have been written where these breaks and blanks are. Uh, Sidney Jellico concluded that the Kali is right in holding that the subsequent text written by the Jews for Jews retained the divine name in Hebrew letters, Paleo Hebraic or Aramaic, um, or Aramaic, or in the Greek letters in imitative from form. Um, and it shows the imitative form there, which is just a uh, one seven one one seven or something like that. Uh, and that's its replacement by Kupiak, 
was a Christian innovation. Jellico draws together evidence from great many scholars, uh, B.J. Roberts, Budesen, Kali, and C.H. Roberts, and various segments of the subject to draw the conclusions that the absence of Adonai from the text suggests that the insertion of the term Kyrios or Karios was later a uh, later practice in the subject against Kyrios is used to substitute the name of Yahweh and the Tetragrammaton appeared in the original text but Christians copyists uh, removed it uh, Asubius and Jerome translator of the Latin Vulgate used Hexapala or Hexapala both attest to the importance of the sacred name and some manuscripts of the subject uh, contain the Tetragrammaton in Hebrew letters. This is further affirmed by the New International Dictionary and the New Testament Theology, which states, and I quote, recently discovered texts doubt the idea that the translators of the LXX subject have rendered the Tetragrammaton JHWH with Kyrios or Kyrios. Um, the an most ancient manuscripts of the LXX today available have the Tetragrammaton written in Hebrew letters in the Greek text. This was custom preserved by the later Hebrew translator of the Old Testament in the first centuries after Christ. The Dead Sea Scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls and other Hebrew and Aramaic texts write only the Tetragrammaton in the Paleo-Hebrew script showing that the name was treated specially. A Greek fragment of Leviticus 26 2-16 discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls of uh, Kimaran was Lao or Leo and the Greek form of the Hebrew uh, trigrammaton Yahweh or Yao uh, YHW the historian John de Linden 6th century wrote and I quote the Roman Viro uh, defining him that is the Jewish God says that he is called the Lao or Leo in the Chaldean mysteries end quote Demis, uh, de or min, uh, 453 Van Kooten mentions that Lao is one of the specifically Jewish designations for God and the Aramaic or Aramaic papyri for, from the Jews at Elephantine show that Lao is the original Jewish term And give me just a second, folks. All right. Hopefully that worked without interrupting here. Um. Now, in the early Jewish Christians inherited from the Jews the practice of reading Lord, where the tetra uh, tetragrammaton appeared in the Hebrew text or where a tetragrammaton may have been marked in the Greek text. Gentile Christians, primarily non-Hebrew speaking and using Greek text, read Lord as it occurred in the Greek text of the New Testament and their copies of the Greek Old Testament. This practice continued into the Latin Vulgate where Lord represented Yahweh in the Latin text. In Petrus Ad, uh, Af, Alphonse's Tetragrammaton Trinity Diagram the name is written as Jeve. Uh, only at the Reformation did the Luther Bible restore Jehovah in the German text of the Luther's Old Testament now um, so it, the Christian translations are as it follows the Septuagint uh, Greek which means Greek translation and the Vulgate the Latin translation uses the word Lord and uh, Kupiak or Karios and Dominus respectively the New Jerusalem Bible 1966 uses Yahweh exclusively the Bible in basic English in 1949-1964 uses Yahweh eight times including Exodus 6-2 the New English Bible in T and uh, OT in 1961, OT in 1970 generally uses the word Lord but uses Jehovah several times for example both forms um, 
the Amplified Bible in 1954-1987 at Exodus and A.B. says, but, may, but by my name, the Lord, and Yahweh, the redemptive name of God, I did not make myself known to them. The Living Bible uses Jehovah or Lord. Um, the Young's Literal Translation Version uses Jehovah. The Holman Christian Standard Bible uses Yahweh over 50 times. The Word English Bi World English Bible, W-E-B, uh, public domain work with no copyright, uses Yahweh some 6,037 times. The Living Translation uses Yahweh eight times. And the preface of the new... Uh, uh, preface of the New Living Translation, second edition, said uh, that in a few cases they have used the name Yahweh. Uh, Rotherham's uh, emphasized Bible retains Yahweh throughout the Old Testament, and uh, the Anchor Bible retains Yahweh throughout the Old Testament. The King James Version rendered in seven instances as Jehovah, four times as the name of God, and uh, and three times where it is included in Hebrew place names, Jehovah Jari. Uh, elsewhere in the KJV, Lord is generally used, but in verses such as Genesis and Psalms and Amos, where this practice would result in the Lord, Lord, uh, Hebrew Adonai, or Yahweh, or Lord, Lord, Yahweh Adonai, the KJV translates the Hebrew text as Lord God. Uh, or Lord God spelled in caps in different ways there Lord in small letters and God in caps and, or, or the Lord God in Lord large letters and and, and the God, word God in small uh, with a big G of course the American Standard Version uses Jehovah and the New World Version translation uses Jehovah over 7,000 times in translations of both the Hebrew and Greek scriptures um, the New Testament, since uh, the Tetragrammaton does not appear in the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, virtually all translations refrain from inserting it into the English. The vast majority of the New Testament translations therefore render the Greek Kyrios uh, as Lord or Lord or Antheos as God. Nevertheless, the Sacred Scriptures Bethel edition inserts the name Yahweh into the New Testament, while the New World Translation inserts the name Jehovah into the New Testament. The main notable exception is Dilich's translation of the New Testament in Hebrew in 1877, which frequently uses the Tetragrammaton, i.e. Hebrew, uh, word particularly in verses where the New Testament quotes or makes reference to the Old Testament text. It is, however, still read aloud as Adonai by most Hebrew-speaking Christians in Israel. Uh, Catholicism, Catholicism. Uh, the Catholic Church, in the first edition of the official Vatican Nova Vulgata, uh, Biblorum Sacrorum Edito, or Ditio, Edito Typica, published in 1979, used the traditional Dominius when re rendering the Tetragrammaton in an overwhelming majority of places where it appears. However, it is also used in the form Yava uh, for rendering the Tetragrammaton in three known places, and that's in, all in Exodus. Um, in second edition of the Nova Vulgata, uh, published in 1886, these few occurrences from form uh, uh, Leva or Lava uh, or Lave were replaced with Dominus. In keeping with the long standing Catholic tradition of avoiding direct usage of the ineffable name, on August 8, 2008. Bishop Arthur C. J. Saratelli, Chairman of the American Bishops Committee on Divine Worship, announced the new directive from the Vatican regarding the use of the name of God in the sacred liturgy. Specifically, the word Yahweh may no longer be used or pronounced in songs and prayers during liturgical, uh, liturgical celebrations. In fact, most of the Church's 2,000-year history use of the name my cat is sitting here scratching at the door just like crazy. You know how they scratch on glass and just going at it, trying to get out there into the snow. Uh, cricket. Hey. 
Would you cut it out? That's just goofy. Okay, sorry, folks. Um, specifically, the all right. So he he forbid the word Yahweh, prohibited. Uh, uh, it was prohibited in public worship out of respect for the divine name, according to the Catholic tradition. But after the Vatican Council. Uh, in 1962 65, some songs and hymns had begun to use the Tetragrammaton, which caused the Vatican to issue a clarification that the divine name was not to be used. Hymnals with these hymns uh, have since inserted the word Lord God or two other two syllable alternatives in place of the Tetragrammaton. Now, Jewish mysticism and the magical papyri, uh, the spellings of the Tetragrammaton occur many. Uh, among the many combinations and permutations of names of powerful agents that occur in the Jewish magical papyri found in Egypt. One of these forms is the heptagram, uh, and I can't pronounce the, the Greek there, but in the Jewish magical papyri, lave or lavia, laba, occurs frequently in the Ethiopic Christian list of magical names of Jesus purporting to have been taught by to him by him to his disciples Yahweh is found or Yahweh the Kabbalah now Kabbalistic tradition holds that the correct pronunciation is known to a select few people in each generation It is not generally known what this pronunciation is in late Kabbalistic works the Tetragrammaton is sometimes referred to as the name of Havaya or Havaya meaning the name of being ex or existence. This name also helps when one needs to refer specifically to the written name, specific, uh, similarly Shem Adonut, meaning the name of Lordship, can be used to refer to the spoken name Adonai specifically. As explained by Moshe Shem Lezato, the Tetragrammaton uh, unfolds in accordance with the intrinsic nature of its letters in the same order in which they appear in the name in the mystery of the ten and the mystery of four, namely the upper cusps of the Yod or Yah, yeah, Yod, uh, is Eric and Pin, and the main body of Yod is Abba, and the first He is Ama. And the Vav is Zirapen. And the second He is Nukva. It unfolds in this aforementioned order in the mystery of the four expansions that are constituted by the following various spellings of the letters. And this all goes to Gematria. Luzato summarizes, in, and I quote, In sum, all that exists is founded on the mystery of this name and upon the mystery of these letters of which it consists. This means that all the different orders and laws are all drawn after and come under the order of these four letters. This is not one particular pathway, but rather the general path, which includes everything that exists in the Sephiroth, uh, in all their details, which brings everything under its order." End quote. Another parallel is drawn between the four letters of the Tetragrammaton and the four worlds. This is associated with the S uh, Atzilith, and the first with the Beria, with is, and the I with Yitzhara, uh, and the final with Asiya, or Astia. And um, with that, since and we can see the Tetragrammaton is in the example of the pyramid. With the sunbursts around it. <coughs> and let us, since it is mentioned, we will go to the Sephirah, just so you know what the Sephirah is and what it's referring to when it's talking about the Kabbalistic natures. Uh, the meaning, uh, the Sephirah, okay, or the Sephirah. Uh, meaning emanations. There are ten attributes or emanations in Kabbalah through which Insof, the infinite, reveals himself and continuously creates both the physical realm and the chain of higher metaphysical realms. The Siddur Hishtalashis 
histolethylis, I can't pronounce that word, but anyway, the term is alternately transliterated into English as sephiroth or sephiroth, uh, singular sephira or sephira. Alternative configurations of the sephiroth are given by different schools in the historical development of Kabbalah, with each articulating different spiritual aspects. The tradition of enumerating ten is stated in Sephira Ten Sephira of nothingness, ten and not nine, ten and not eleven. As altogether eleven Sephiroth are listed across the different schemes, two, the Keter and the Dath, or the Deat, are seen as unconscious and conscious manifestations of the same principle conserving the ten categories. In Kabbalah, the functional structure of the Sephirot in channeling divine creative life force and revealing the unknowable divine essence to creation is described. The first Sephirot describes the divine will above intellect. The next Sephirot describes conscious divine intellect and the latter Sephirot describe the primary and secondary conscious divine emotions. Two Sephiroth, the Bana and the Matut, are feminine, as the female principle in Kabbalah describes a vessel that receives outward male light and then inwardly nurtures and gives birth to the lower Sephiroth. Corresponding to this is the female divine presence, uh, which is Sitzana in Hebrew. And uh, Kabbalah sees the human soul as mirroring the divine after Genesis 1-27. Uh, God created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created him, he, uh, male and female, he created them, end quote. And more widely, all creations as reflection of their life force in the Sephirah. Therefore, the Sephirah also describe the spiritual life of man, and constitute the conceptual paradigm in Kabbalah for understanding everything. This relationship between the soul of man and the divine gives Kabbalah one of its two central metaphors in describing divinity. Alongside the or, or light, metaphor, however, Kabbalah repeatedly stresses the need to avoid all corporeal interpretation. Through this, the sephirah are related to the structure of the body and are reformed into parsifim, or personas. Underlying the structural purpose of each sephirah is a hidden motivational force which is understood best by comparison with the corresponding psychological state and human spiritual ex experience. The Hasidic philosophy, which is sought to internalize the experience of Jew Jewish mysticism into daily inspiration, the vikas, uh, this inner life of the sephiroth is explored and the role they play in man's service of God in this world. And of course, here's a, one picture of the the Sephiroth and the Jewish Kabbalah. We can actually go over here, and I like this picture here down here. There, let me find it. Let me find it. Oh, I know it's here somewhere. I saw it. I seen did it. <laughs> there it is. Geomancy, and this describes the planets. Okay, there's Saturn, there's Jupiter, the Sun in the middle, Earth is on the bottom. Hopefully, everybody can see that. Okay, you can get this by going to uh, Google Images. Of Yahweh or of the of the Tetragrammaton you'll get all kinds of pictures but this is pictures in there too uh, earthopuncture info under geomancy but it's just do a Google search for Yahweh for the or for the Tetragrammaton there and you'll find the images under the image section um, in this section so back uh, and if you want to read more on the Sephiroth we could go way into detail on the Sephiroth but that's actually out of the uh, out of the category of, of what we're talking about here but if you want to you can look it up uh, Sephiroth 
S E F I R O T. Go to Wikipedia. You can read this whole thing. Let us go over to Jehovah now to finish out this part one. I know it's already been a long journey, but we need to cover Jehovah for a moment. Um, the word Jehovah, uh, the Arab Aramaic religions, and Jehovah is a disambiguation, uh, is a Latinization of the Hebrew, a vocalization of the Tetragrammaton, and the same as Yahweh or Y-H-W-H, the proper name of God of Israel of the Hebrew Bible, which has also been transcribed as Yehovah or Yahweh. It appears uh, 6,518 times in, in the traditional Masoretic text, in addition to 305 instances of Jehovah. The earliest available Latin text to use the vocalization similar to Jehovah dates from the 13th century. Most scholars believe that Jehovah to be a late uh, circa 1100 CE hybrid form derived from combining the Latin letters JHVH with the vowels of Adonai. But there is some evidence that may have already been in use in late antiquity, uh, the 5th century. The consensus among scholars is that the historical vocalization of the Tetragrammaton at the time of the redaction of the Torah in the 6th century BCE is most likely Yahweh. However, there is a disagreement. Uh, the historical vocalization was lost because in Second Temple Judaism, Judaism <coughs> you can tell I'm stumbling over my own tongue. I've been reading too long myself here. During the 3rd and 2nd centuries BCE, the pronunciation of the Tetragrammaton came to be avoided, being substituted with Adonai, meaning my Lord. I, I want to stress again, it is what Adonai means, or Adonai means my Lord. It is not ref Adonai is not the proper name of any individual god. Okay? Some people think it is, and it's not. Um, not in our language, anyway. <laughs> Most scholars believe Jehovah to be late uh, 11th uh, century, uh, or 10th century, sorry, uh, a hybrid form derived by combining the Latin letters J-H-V-H with the vowels of Adonai. Uh, but some hold that there is evidence that the Jehovah form of the Tetragrammaton may have been in use in Semitic and Greek phonic texts or phonic texts and artifacts from late antiquity. Others say it is the pronunciation Yahweh that is testified in both Christian and pagan texts of the early Christian era. The Karaite Jews, as proponents of the, rend of the rendering Jehovah, state that although the original pronunciation of Yahweh has been obscured by disuse of the spoken name according to oral rabbinic law, well-established English transliterations of other Hebrew personal names are accepted in normal usage, such as Joshua, Isaiah, or Jesus for which the original pronunciations may be unknown. They also point out that the English form Jehovah is quite simply an angelicized form of Yehovah and preserves the four Hebrew consonants uh, YHVH with the introduction of the J sound in English. Some argue that Jehovah is preferable to uh, Yahweh based on their conclusion that the Tetragrammaton was likely trisyllabic originally meaning three syllables, and that the modern forms should therefore have three syllables. According to the Jewish tradition, developed in the 3rd to 2nd centuries BCE, the Tetragrammaton is written but not pronounced. When read, substitute terms replace the divine name where it appears in the text. It is widely assumed that proposed by the 19th century Hebrew scholar Jesenius, Jesenius that the vowels of the substitutes of the name Adonai, meaning Lord, and the Elohim, meaning God, were inserted by the Masoretes to indicate that these substitutes were to be used. When, uh, when none, I like calling it none because that's what it looks like when it's spelled, but anyway, when the word proceeds or follows Adonai, the Masoretes place the vowel points of the Elohim in the Tetragrammaton producing a different vocalization of the Tetragrammaton, which was read by as Elohim. 
Based on this reasoning, the form Jehovah has been characterized by some as a hybrid form, and even a philological impossibility. Early modern translators disregarded the practice of reading Adonai, or its equivalents in Greek and Latin, mean Cupioc and Dominus, in place of the Tetragrammaton, and instead combined the four Hebrew letters of the Tetragrammaton with the vowel points that, except in synagogue scrolls, accompanied them, resulting in the form Jehovah. This form, which first took effect in works dated 1278 and 1303, was adopted in Tyndale's and some other Protestant translations of the Bible. In 1611, the King James Version of uh, Jehovah occurred seven times. In 1901, the American Standard Version, the form Jehovah, became a regular English, English rendering of the Hebrew all throughout, and the pre preference to the previously dominant the Lord, which is generally used in the King James Version. It is also used in Christian hymns, such as the 1771 hymn, Guide Me, O, great, o Thou Great Jehovah. <coughs> Excuse me. Development. The most widely spread theory is that the Hebrew term has the vowel points, Adonai, using the vowels of Adonai and the composite Hatapta under the guttural Aleph X uh, becomes a Shiva or the Yod uh, and Holam is placed over the first He or He and then Kamats or Kamats is placed under the Vav giving Jehovah Jehovah when the two names uh, occur together the former is pointed with the Hataf Sigol under the Yahol or the Yad, Yad, and the Harik under the second He, giving the uh, giving to indicate that it is to be read as Elohim, in order to avoid Adonai being repeated. Now, the pronunciation of Jehovah is believed to have risen through the introduction of vowels of the cure uh, or the query. Uh, the marginal note notation used by the Masoretes in places were the consonants of the text to be read. The Kiri differed from the consonants in the written text, the Kathib, uh, or Kathib. They wrote the Kir, Kiri in margin to indicate that the Kathib was read using the vowels of the Kiri. For a few very frequent words, the marginal note was omitted, referred to Kiri Perpitum. Uh, one of these frequent cases was God's name, which was not to be pronounced in fear of profaning the ineffable name. Instead, wherever Yahweh appears in the Kathib of the biblical and liturg liturg uh, liturgical uh, books, it was to be read as Adonai, my, meaning my Lord, a plural of majesty, or, an, or as Elohim, meaning God, if Adonai appears next to it. The combination produces Yehovah, or Yehovi, respectively. It is also written or even a red Hashim, the name. Scholars are not in total agreement as to why uh, does not uh, does not have precise why the spelling the Hebrew spelling does not have precisely the same vowel points as Adonai. But the use of the composite Hatef Segol in cases where the name is read Elohim has led to the opinion that composite Hatapata ought to have been used to indicate the reading Adonai. It has been argued conversely that the disuse of the Pata is consistent with the Babylonian system in which the composite is uncommon. Now, I'm going to cut off short here because this is basically just going over a lot of re repetitiveness of what we have already read, um, making out the same points. All the points point to the fact that these terms that we use, and these names that we use today, simply refer to the Lord God, the God, uh, the Lord, or uh, God the Lord, or I am who I am, or I, uh, I, I who has been, is, and will be. Uh, either way, none of them are again the proper name of the Creator or the Lord. Um, you 
you know, you can you can come here if you want to investigate more about the word Jehovah, if you are into using that word. Um, I particularly myself don't use any of them, <laughs> but that's just me. Um, so with that, that will end our part one because this has been long enough, and I think everybody can see the points now. Uh, so the people who play name games again refer to the first thing I read during this, which was was a rereading of a somebody had asked me the question and had brought that to me about the name and uh, and specifically people going around talking about the name Yahweh means some moon god or whatever, which is which is untrue. We covered that in the first part of this, and again we're talking of spirit. We're talking of a creator that is outside of this construct, okay? We're not talking about any of the lesser gods, although some are relating to lesser gods. But when I think of creator, when I think of God, Lord, etc., the makers, uh, the maker of heaven and earth, um, I'm not talking about, you know, in my own personal reference to any of the lesser gods that were either made up by man or that were fallen angels that became to be worshipped as deities uh, whether you want to call them angels nowadays or I mean uh, angels or aliens I don't care what you label them again the point of, of my dissertation here is that it matters what is inside your heart and what you are actually referencing to it doesn't matter what name you have been taught to use Okay, it matters what is inside of you because, believe me, through uh, ascertaining on my own a certain level of consciousness to where I have been to a level of consciousness where words are obsolete. There is no words in our language that can describe or even become close to that language which is a it's a t it's more like a telepathic language you don't need words in that state of mind and that level of consciousness and that heightened uh, illuminated state of spirituality um, words aren't needed you don't even need words to talk to people you can look at each other and you know what you're feeling, you know what you want to say without ever even saying it. Okay? And I don't know, there may be other people out there, I'm sure there are, whether they're listening to this or not is a different story, but I mean, I know there's other people who would know exactly what I'm referring to. Okay? Where you reach and attain a level of being where words have no meaning. And part two, we're going to get into the different variations of Jesus, uh, Yeshua, Yahushua, uh, Isu, and their origins and meanings as well, just like we did through this with Yahweh. Uh, personally, to me, he is Father, period. And with that, I thank you for joining me. And blessings to you all.